Hi, Brian. It's nice to see you again. I nice see you. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Kimberly Smith, and I am here today with Brian Stutzman. And the reason why I wanted to have him on today is to talk about a very a critical part of um, of Carthage, and that's the history of of Illinois, the history of Warsaw, and everything leading up to Carthage um, to understand who killed Joseph Smith and why. And the reason why I wanted to interview Brian today is because Justin Griffin was recently interviewed on Midnight Mormons, and he made a very startling admission. And I just want to play this clip so everyone can hear it for themselves. So let me just get it on the screen here. Find it. Okay, it's just a really quick clip. So two sec, two or three seconds. Here we go. Let me know if you can hear it. Where I'm not an expert is everything before and everything after. I okay, so did you hear that? <laughs> Right, so he's admitting that he is not an expert on everything leading up to Carthage and everything after. So why does that matter? Well, th thanks for having me on. Let me share this screen here with you. Um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book called The History of uh, Warsaw, Illinois, because for those who don't know, a lot of people in the church have been to Nauvoo and have been to Carthage, but they don't realize where Warsaw is. And it's 18 miles uh, kind of away from Nauvoo and Carthage. Each, it's kind of makes this triangle. And Warsaw is where the mob came from that stormed Carthage jail. Um, it's really hard to take a movie like Who Killed Joseph Smith? 177 years after the crime, go to the crime scene, 177 years after and try to recreate and hypothesize what possibly could have happened. So many remodels have happened and so many things have happened over the years. It, it's, it's not very uh, solid history. And so what you need to really do, and you can't really take just the statement from one or two witnesses, because there's a lot more people there, just John Taylor and Willard Richards statements. Um, they most likely had post-traumatic stress disorder or other things it's you know talk to somebody who's been in a major car accident five years after they don't even want to talk about it or give the details correctly and that's kind of what justin's done here um, the history really tells a different story than his movie and it's really important to know what happened before and after uh the, the the day of the martyrdom. So I'd like to start with this uh, article from June 12, 1844 in the Warsaw Signal. What has happened here is that on what the 10th or, or the 11th, uh, the 10th, I think it was when the city counts, uh, when, when the expositor newspaper was destroyed and on the 11th, Charles uh, Foster comes and brings this letter to the Warsaw newspaper, Thomas Sharp, and they tell about what's happening. And so what happened to the press and why. And so they published this in the newspaper and right below it, uh, Thomas Sharp chimes in. And this is probably one of the most famous quotes dealing with the martyrdom. Uh, and I've got it boxed here in red. And after he comments, after he, he you know, this, this story is told, uh, Thomas Sharp writes, you know, we receive this communication, um, citizens arise one and all, you know, we can't let this go by, let your, you know, we don't have time for comment, let every man make their own, let it be made with powder and ball. And so this goes out to Missouri, this goes out to community, uh, different communities in the area. And, and Thomas Sharp is basically saying, hey, let's, you know, we've had enough with the Mormons, we've had enough with Joseph Smith, let's go and kill him. And it's right here published in the newspaper. So there was tension in the uh, area around uh, Warsaw, so what happened, or uh, the whole area. So what happened on June 27th, 1844, uh, we know that Governor Ford went to Nauvoo in the morning. We know that uh, four people are eventually left in the jail. There was more people coming and going. Uh, uh, we talked about, uh, uh, you know, Dan Jones and, and others. So a couple regiments, uh, from Warsaw and one from Green Plains uh, uh, assemble in Warsaw and they go up to this area called Golden's Point. And it's still there today. 
and they have a meeting. It's about noonish, maybe a little after, and they debate what they should do. About this time, a messenger from Governor Ford in Nauvoo comes with a note, and the governor knows you're here, and he asks you to go home. And part of the mob goes back to Warsaw. And at the very same time, or real close to it, one of the guards at Carthage Jail, Frank Worrell, he writes a note and sends it by messenger to the mob. And he says, now's the time to do the deed. Well, Levi Williams and Thomas Sharp are, are speaking to the crowd. And they said, let's go on and get this done. And they said, if we kill Joseph Smith in Carthage jail, the Mormons will hear about it. And they'll probably kill Governor Ford in Nauvoo because the people in Warsaw were having problems with both. And they, they said, we'll get rid of two of our problems at once. They voted and they marched on to Carthage jail. This is just history. Um, when they got to the jail, and I'm not sure what slide I have next. Uh, there, there's more than four people at the jail. Here's Mark Aldridge on one side and Thomas Sharp on the other. Um, these are some, some of the men that were participated in the murder. When they got to the jail, they stormed the jail. Um, the theory that somehow just at the, the exact moment that the mobs are shooting Joseph and Hiram, that somebody inside the jail, such as Willard, uh, Willard Richards, uh, or John Taylor just happened to have guns or grab guns and, and shot Joseph and Hiram at the very same time. That's just, that's mental gymnastics just outside of just what, what reality is, okay? It's, it's just far-fetched. The reality is the mob started firing. There was dozens and dozens of bullet holes found inside the, the, the jail uh, when the, the attorney went, came the next uh, little while after. Um, nobody said that uh, they found Joseph and Hiram dead. In fact, Joseph was alive when he, when he jumped out the window. Uh, the mob had a cannon that sounded after, the, after it was done, uh, after, after the deed was done, as, as to use for Frank Worrell's words. So what we have here is that uh, they went to the, the jail to kill him, and they never said that, well, we got there and they were already dead. We need to congratulate whoever did the job for us. That night, the mob went back to Warsaw. This is uh, the, the, where the Warsaw house is. It's said that the back part is the hotel. It's called the Fleming Tavern, uh, the restaurant where the mob met. At about 9 p.m., Thomas Sharp's the first one in, and about 50 people come, and they start bragging about what they had just done. They claim that they did it. Um, but how do we know this? Anne Fleming not a member of the church was the owner, Anne and Sam Fleming. Sam was out of town and she starts cooking a meal for the mob. But her niece, Eliza Graham, Eliza J. Graham, what a phenomenal young lady. She's 18 years old. She's a member of the church, had no idea. Nobody in the town knew what had happened. The mob comes back, they start bragging. Eliza takes mental notes of who said what? Jacob Davis, William Grover, uh, they all start bragging about who had done the deed. Thomas Sharp said it was my gun that, that, that killed Joseph. Um, so what was really cool is that Eliza Graham testified the next year. Uh, so we know that they were, they were bragging about it. The next day, June 28th at 4 p.m. In in, in, on Main Street in Warsaw, they had a meeting. Uh, this, people spoke about what they had done, how they killed Joseph Smith. They threw their hats in the air. They were kind of proud. They were enemies. They, they, uh, they, uh, <laughs> they never once said that somebody else had killed Joseph Smith. In the newspaper in Warsaw, July 10th, so this is what, two, two and a half two weeks after the martyrdom, Thomas Sharp admits that they killed him. And they said, we claim that the community in which we live is a law abiding community and that it will go as far, it will go as far to maintain the supremacy of the law in any other way in the, you know, like any other, <laughs> any other city in the nation, our citizens have regretted and still regret the necessity that existed for taking the law in this particular instance into their own hands, but it would happen sooner or later. So that this whole story is about killing Joseph Smith and they admit it in the paper. Now this is very dangerous because the next year, there's a trial, Kimberly. 
Eliza mm -hmm. Graham comes, nine people are charged, five, four fled, five sit trial. And the bottom line is their life was on the line. They could have been hung if found guilty. Not once did they go to trial and say, whoa, 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 you got it wrong. We went to the jail to kill Joseph, but he was already dead because somebody inside had already killed him. Right. <laughs> they put their life on the line. There was six days of testimony and it was kind of a kangaroo court, but it didn't start out that way. Their life was really on the line. During the beginning of the trial, the, the defense asked the judge to dismiss the jury and put their own jury on. Uh, so they didn't know that it was going to be a kangaroo court till, the, till it actually started. Um, John Hay, who is probably the most famous person from Warsaw, summarized the, what happened at the, at the trial that uh, it, it was called Court Week in, in 1845. He wrote in the Atlantic Monthly Magazine about the trial. There was not a man on the jury in the court in the county that did not know the defendants had not done the murder, but it was not proven and the ver verdict of not guilty was right in the law. In fact, years later, somebody asked Thomas Sharp, who was one of the five who said the trial, you killed Joseph Smith? And he shrugged his shoulders and says, well, the, the jury said not. Everybody in the county knew that these guys had done it. They didn't know that John Taylor and Willard Richard did it. They knew that the five had, who stood trial had done it. Um, they even went to their grave talking about it. W.W. Uh, w. Chittenden in his biography, um, well, um, this was written uh, after he died. Uh, he, they wrote, again, he was from Warsaw. He took an active part in driving the Mormons from Illinois and was present when Smith, the Mormon prophet, was killed. He knew the men who fired the fatal shots. There were four of them. So the summary here is, oh, and the question, the, the question comes up, well, well, did Brigham Young orchestrate the mob? Well, first of all, Brigham Young was in Boston at the time of the martyrdom, but they the people in Warsaw, you can read the Warsaw newspaper, after the martyrdom, they had conflicts with Brigham Young. They were not friends. Uh, the Battle of Nauvoo happened. Who's, lead, you know, who's involved in that? Thomas Sharp, for one, he led a group. And they were shooting at the Mormons, Brigham Young. Right. <laughs> and they <laughs> drove the Mormons out of Nauvoo in three main waves, the Exodus. Brigham Young, they, they could have said, well, we were once friends with Brigham Young. He, he put us up to kill and Joseph, but now we're in it. So they never said anything like that. They continued the animosity and, and hatred. So here we have a summary. The mob in Warsaw, they gathered to kill Joseph Smith. They marched on. There's no dispute that they marched on that day. And Justin gets it wrong in his movie. He said it was a, the mob was there at midnight the night before. This mob was in Warsaw the, the, the morning of. Uh, more, just more errors in his movie. The mob claimed they did it, they stood trial, and they died with people saying that they did it. So anybody with a, who says anything different, first of all, doesn't understand the history before and after and what's going on in Hancock County, which is a lot more important than going to a crime scene 177 years later and trying to re-suppose what could have happened. We know what happened. The history is there. The accounts are there. So you have to ask what their motive is. Why are they trying to put forth a different narrative than what, what the accounts support? And of course, his motive, it seems, in this movie is just to, you know, say Brigham Young isn't the rightful heir and, and some other things. And, and there's other fragmented groups. Uh, Justin's uh, claims are not new. They've been debunked over and over. He's just recycling uh, claims of people who chose to choose, follow other people instead of Brigham Young, because they have to justify why Brigham Young uh, couldn't be the, you know, the correct successor. So they look and say, well, could he kill Joseph Smith or been behind it? The answer is absolutely not. Thanks, Kimberly. Any questions? Yeah, that was excellent. I appreciate you giving us this history. It's, it, it's an important, you know, part of the puzzle. And it's especially an important part of understanding why Joseph Smith was killed, not only that he was killed, but why. And um, I just have two quotes I wanted to share that I, I, I feel like also um, adds to the conversation because we know that both Stephen Markham and Dan Jones were in the jail with Joseph and Hiram and John Taylor and Wheeler Richards up until the day of the martyrdom. 
And it's interesting that um, Stephen Markham wrote that on the afternoon of June 26, that there was an anti-Mormon meeting at the Hamilton Hotel. And he actually kind of spied on this, on this meeting. He happened, he came upon it by chance. He went there to try to talk to the governor and he heard that there was this meeting going on. So he kind of stood outside the door and listened. And he said, this is what he wrote. He said, it was proposed that if Illinois, now this is a direct quote of what he heard. It was proposed that if Illinois and Missouri would join forces to kill the Mormon leader, they would not be brought to justice for it. And then he goes on to say, there were delegates at the meeting from every state of the union except for three. And so we're not just talking about, you know, the mob, just a mob wanting to kill Joseph Smith. They, this was the state of Illinois, the government, and then the government in, in Missouri, and then even the government in other states of the union, which is, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty big conspiracy. Um, so the next day, a few hours before the attack on the jail, Markham was forced to leave Carthage at Bayonet Point. So now that, you know, they, they're trying to get rid of the number of people in that jail cell. And then you, you also mentioned Frank Worrell, and he was a lieutenant in the Carthage Grays. And he told Dan Jones, he said, quote, we've had too much trouble to bring old Joe here to let him ever escape alive. And unless you want to die with him, you would better leave before sundown. The history is there. Mark, right. and they, his blood, boots were full of blood was one account as they forced him out. And I, I, I'll leave you this thought, Kimberly. Um, you can Google Dan Jones in my name. I wrote an article. Dan Jones was the recipient of Joseph Smith's last prophecy the night before the martyrdom. Right. It's absolutely phenomenal and moving account and a testament of the prophetic gifts of the prophet Joseph because it, it, it came true. And Joseph Smith also gave a prophecy of the city of Warsaw that's come true. And, right. Uh, it's, it's pretty... Uh, pretty amazing but dan dan jones was, turned out to be one of the most phenomenal missionaries and the prophecy joseph gave him was about his future mission to wales not knowing that they'd ever leave there alive dan jones is painting is pictured as one of the greatest missionaries of the restoration his painting is on the mtc wall in Provo, Utah, as you come in, and if your your viewers and anybody opens up the preach my gospel uh, manual, page one, chapter one, is a painting of Dan Jones preaching in Wales, a direct fulfillment of the prophecy of Joseph Smith the night before he was martyred. Yes, that's an excellent point. Yeah, and you'd 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 have to wonder if he could prophesy about Dan Jones, and, and then he'd also prophesied about, he told the, the governor that he knew his, his heart was thirsted for his blood. You'd think that he would know then the thoughts and the intents of the hearts of John Taylor and Willie Richards. Um, I just have one more um, question for you really quick. So we heard at the beginning that Justin Griffins, you know, he admitted that he does not know what happened leading up to Carthage and, and what happened after. And so you think that in order to understand his theory a little, little bit better, that he would welcome those that did know what happened leading up to Carthage. And, um, and I believe that he actually banned you from coming, commenting on his Who Killed Joseph Smith Facebook page. Why do you think that is? Um, interesting question, Kimberly. Um, when I found his Facebook page, when I heard the movie was co coming out, I posted some of these facts. I never confronted. I was not swearing. I was not hostile. Um, I was I was putting forward some of these facts that contradict him. All of a sudden, without notice, I cannot post anything on his page. Yet he says he welcomes all comments. He's not telling the truth when he makes that statement. He bans people that know more than he does, or on certain subjects. I don't claim to know more than he does on other things. But Warsaw, the mob before and after is my specialty. I spent almost 10 years. I've been to Warsaw multiple, multiple times and spent, I've got boxes and boxes of research. He's got it wrong. I was showing he was got it wrong and they bought me. I did it in a very polite way. So I does one thing and does something else. Right. Yeah. He, he, he welcomes all comments. No, he does not. 
Right. Or he says he's just after the truth, but whose truth is he after, right? Yeah. Good point. Thanks, Kimberly, for having me on. Yep. Thank you.